All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zero Dark Nerdy, the world's most notorious pop culture podcast. This is your boy Brian, a.k.a. El Nino. Today I am joined with Ryan Saba, a.k.a. Captain Cleveland, and we have a very special guest in the building, none other than Sean Patrick Flannery, here to promote his new film released today in select theaters, Born a Champion. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, brother. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Well, let's 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 get right into it. You know, just kind of tell us what you've been up to, and obviously, uh, we would love to know, learn a little bit more about Born a Champion. Uh, what have I been up to? Well, for the last 11, 12 days, I've been sequestered. I'm in quarantine. I'm in Toronto, Canada. Oh, wow. I'm here to shoot a TV show, but I got four more days, so I'm, I, I can give you a tour of this place. I've seen every square millimeter of this place. <laughs> have not left once. Like there's a protocol when you take your garbage out to the garbage chute. So uh, that's what that's what I've been doing in the immediate uh, prior week and a half. I got another half a week or so. The days are blended together to me. But uh, uh, looking forward to getting out of here and then uh, and uh, shooting a show for uh, Amazon Prime it's a TV show uh, that has superheroes in it. Nice. Love it. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I, I can't say. <laughs> I'm so not let's talk. supposed to be talking about it. So all, yeah. I, know, all I did was tell you the, the channel. Uh-huh. uh-huh. We, I, think we, we, I think we might have an idea. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Before we I get into the name like Zero Dark Nerdy, you guys might be plugged in. <laughs> we do. Little, we are. So yeah. talk about Born a Champion. Let, let's get into that one. Uh, you know what? This is a – it's a – I'm reluctant to even use the term passion project because that usually means uh, something that's bad, but somebody – it's something – subject matter that somebody loves so uh, they did it anyway but it truly is this is something that i wrote in bed way back in 2007 and that should give you an idea of the gestation process of filmmaking it took uh till 2019 for us to actually get on the movie set and we actually showed it to a motor oil company uh racing oil additive lucas oil uh, force lucas his son morgan lucas and force wife charlotte they read it they loved it and they let us go make a movie and it's about uh five things that are most important in my life uh and that's faith family uh fatherhood and love and legacy and uh a large portion of that is jujitsu and i wrote the story about that some of the most impactful things in my life and i, I hope that comes across on the screen So I I want to I want to go back to the writing piece of it because you know this is your first writing credit right so I think that um, I'm just curious how how is it different because you've been you've been acting for a long time right so how is it different when somebody else writes it for you and you kind of just you act it out or when you are the writer and then you are actually physically acting out the, the, the words that were, were coming out of your mind. What's, what's the difference there? Well, I'll tell you this. I moved out to LA originally to be a writer. I wrote a piece of children's theater and I moved out to LA to be a writer. Uh, it, it just seemed a lot more objective and less subjective to me than being an actor. <laughs> Excuse me. For example, I mean, I, I felt quite confident that I could, wait tables, save my money, rent a theater and produce a play that I wrote. Um, and in the, in the course of that, an agent said, Hey, let me submit you on some commercials. And I said, ah, you know, if it supplements my writing in, in, income, sure. And then I got a string of those and she goes, you know what, let me submit you on some theatrical, which means uh, TV and movie. I said, yeah, if it supplements my income. And the next thing I know, I was on a plane to go do young indie. So uh, I actually moved out to be a writer. <clears throat> um, and it's not that I didn't love acting. I just didn't like something that was that out of my control. It seems like you go into every audition with a lot of hope. There's not a design program that says, if you do these five things, you can realize success. Right. And I'm, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big put all my eggs in the basket of hope. Um, I, 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 I am, I'm not a control freak, but I like to be in charge of my destiny. And, and that's how it happened. Lo and behold, the prospect of being employed as an actor in L.A. is certainly a lot less daunting than you would think. Um, you know, there are, you know, I don't know how many million actors in L.A. Uh, the vast majority of them suck. Um, I, I, it, it's just the truth. I mean, I was waiting tables at TGI Fridays and I, when, when a guy saw me in a commercial, he's like, man, I think I'm going to get an agent, too. This dude had never even thought about acting. There, there's no <laughs> barrier to entry. So, of course, he sucked. He'd never even thought about doing it. Sure. So. 
you know, it's uh, so in essence, I, I've been a writer for quite some time. I, I wrote for a number of periodicals. Um, as a matter of fact, right now I'm in development for a piece that originally was published by Jane Magazine in 1998. Wow. I, I ended up converting it into my first book that was published by Hachette uh, in 2016. And now we're developing, developing it into a fixed part miniseries. Wow. Uh, so I've been a writer for a long time. But having uh, saying words that are yours as opposed to somebody else, you know, the difference in TV and movie, when you do a film, it seems through 30 years in this business that they're, 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 they're much more open to you putting the words in a way that would leave your tongue in an authentic manner. Mm -hmm. TV can be very specific. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So the, 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 it, it, although the mediums are quite, quite the same, you know, one's a screen that big, one's a screen that big. Uh, but uh, they're just dealt with in a very different manner. But uh, good writing is good writing. Um, you know, I, I, I've certainly done scripts where I wouldn't even think of suggesting changing a syllable. Sure. And I've done scripts where I thought this is absolute drivel. It needs a page one <laughs> rewrite. You know, I, I've made a career out of, if you look at my IMDb page, I think I have 130 something credits. Yeah. You know, I'm not kidding when I tell you 99.5% of them. I hope the public never sees. Uh, it's that point five, the end result that you're like, man, I hope people watch this. Sure. And it always ends up being the 99.5 that they do see, you know, but, uh, but I, I see the amount of variables that have to be in sync to make a, a film great. And you can start with an amazing script. Every decision only takes you away from a perfect score. You know, if you do it right, it just stays there. It doesn't yeah. elevate, it just stays there. Every time you cast wrong, ah, it's a little less. Every time you don't get that killer location, you got to rewrite it to satisfy a different location, it goes a little less. So I've certainly seen, I've certainly seen some amazing scripts that get lost in the execution, and then I've seen some that stay buoyant and float to the top. Awesome, nice, nice. So, um, you know, as far as in, in in regards to your current film, how how was it working with uh, with Dennis Quaid and uh, Katrina Bowden? Man, both of them, you know, I, 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 I'll be honest with you. When I work with somebody that's an ass, I probably will just go, oh, it was great and move on. Sure. But when I work with somebody that's solid, I'll tell you, those two are absolute gems. Katrina Bowden has a certain pathos behind the eyes that I think is irreplicable. Mm -hmm. And she's a wonderful human being. Mm -hmm. Dennis is about as solid a dude as you can find. That's the awesome. dude rolled up onto the set and I'm like, wow, kick your shoes up. You know what I mean? It's like, pass me a beer. The, the dude is like, you've known him for 20 years and he's solid. Zero pretense. I can't say enough about it. And, you know, I've been a Disc Quake fan my whole life, as has everybody else. Right. You don't want somebody like that to let you down, man. Sure. I don't know what happened about this film, but every, every, a lot, every choice we made kind of held up. Uh, it, it, it's Reno Wilson was a revelation to me. I, 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 I'd never even heard of Reno Wilson. And this guy, his rendition of Louis Armstrong, Google search that, the amazing actor, mm -hmm. and one of the most best humans I've ever met. Uh, Maurice Comte, uh, it knocks this role out of the park. We were very lucky. And again, I, I would probably brush over somebody if they didn't impress me, but if they do, I'll tell you. And across the board with this movie, um, Honored to be on screen with this cast, man. Honestly. It's awesome. great. It's great to hear. I mean, the passion's undeniable, man. It's yeah. it's there. I mean, it's 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 great. Uh, you know, you, you kind of talked about you've been doing this for 30 years. You know, you started, I was looking at IMDB, you know, your first your first acting credits, 1987. I mean, you've you've really done it all, right? You've done, you know, cult classic movies, you've done you know, box office movies, you've done Young and the Restless, you've done TV shows like Dexter. I mean, how how has it changed for you? Just you as a person, obviously, you know, you're a family man or whatever, but how, how's it changed for you as a person, your approach, the process? How's it changed for you over the 30 plus years you've been doing this? You know, I'd love to give you some big story that involves an arc where I started one place, but, it, but it, it's the same. Um, I mean, I love the process. I love bringing a role to light. I love adding 
my life experiences to the world of a character that's presented to me. I also love writing them on my own. Um, and the medium has never really mattered to me. Like you said, I've done everything from, you know, student films to soap operas. And I've loved them all. Like when I do, did Young and the Restless, I loved doing that. I'm not kidding. I loved it. Um, I, 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 Young Indiana Jones let me travel the world. I think I went to 52 different countries on that. I had to get a passport for that job, man. Um, and you said I've done Blockbuster. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I appreciate it, but I did one big budget film. I, I knew you were going to say that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I did one big budget film, man, ever. And it was with uh, Sylvester Stallone. And it, it, it ended up being called uh, I See You. And the one big budget film I did never came out, man. Or it came out like five years later and kind of went uh, direct to DVD. But uh, that was my first time I'd ever been on set and seen a craft service snack truck that was an 18-wheeler. I mean, it was basically you could go up there and you could say, you know what? Give me a hot turkey and uh, Swiss open face mashed potatoes gravy. Would you like uh, cream gravy or brown gravy? Hey, you know what? Let's go with cream today. I mean, it was just like, what? I'm used to doing movies where there's like a, a styrofoam cup with Cheetos and right, maybe one right. bruised banana. And I was like, what? I'm like, no wonder movies cost $100 million. That 18 wheeler <laughs> alone has to be a million bucks for the run of this six month film. I mean, that was, a, that was my one experience on a budget like that. And whoo, man, we shot a scene for a week. A week it kind of blew my mind man wow. so I, I you're right i have done one big budget and man if it was up to me i'd do a lot of those babies <laughs> i would i would argue i would argue that by the time uh boondock saints 2 came out that was a, a movie that a lot of people were looking forward to you know that 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 was the one that i considered like the blockbuster but you know maybe i was maybe i was wrong there um no 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 don't get me wrong i mean both of those films did ridiculous box office uh, but they came out, you know, Boondock 1 came out to a theater in Chicago for 10 right. minutes. Right. Boondock 2 went to, I believe the total was 60 theaters, and it lasted in theaters a week, and they pulled it. It made all its money by people taking the DVD and going, wow, watch yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, that, that's a very different thing from a huge budget. And again, on both of those films, we didn't have huge budgets to do it at sure. all. Yeah. We, we, we did it on a shoestring and made something that we're incredibly proud of, and the public embraced it, and the, the, the most profound and powerful marketing strategy is when your best friend, who you trust implicitly, goes, dude, watch that. Right. Trust Agreed. me. That's how I, saw, that's, that's that's how I saw the original. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's what happened, man. But that's not, that's not by design. If right. it was, everybody would do it. You yeah. know, when somebody goes like, how do you make a cult classic? It's like, <laughs> you, Every, every film I've ever made, the hope is that it's a cult class. Right. You know what I mean? If anybody right. had the recipe, they'd be pumping them out left and right. It's <laughs> like when, when you hear some musician going, my next hit single is going to be. It's like, let's wait and see how, it, how it's received determines if, if it's a hit. Yeah. That's not like, well, I label it. What, what kind of music do you make? I make hits. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like only the public determines success or failure, at least in box office. Right. Right. And I mean, that definitely did. And we're, we're talking obviously before social media too, because a, even though you don't judge a book by its cover, obviously the cover of boondock saints is very iconic. And I mean, back then when we're, when the video stores were open, you know, it was always one that I saw and that was definitely probably to this day, the biggest word of mouth advertising for a movie I've ever seen was boondock saints. Cause it was always one of those. Have you seen this? No, you haven't. You need to go watch it. So to especially to do it in a time before social media where everybody can just kind of post and hashtag stuff, I mean, just incredibly impressive. And I know it's something that uh, you and the crew are, are very proud of. I know we got to wrap up here shortly, but we, you know, we got to ask, obviously, because we are a pop culture podcast. Are there any particular jujitsu fighters that, that, that you just really enjoy watching, whether past or present? And do you have any just favorite like kung fu, you know, jujitsu movies, like any kind of like, uh, like boxing, Marshmars. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> any, any, any favorites in the catalog? I mean, you know, you know, all, all of my jujitsu players, uh, I like, I, I'm a big fan of Damian Maya. Uh, I'm a big fan of seeing uh, Nick Diaz on the ground. Yeah. I mean, guys that truly implement jujitsu. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of somebody 
being a specialist and having the ability to take the fight into the arena of that specialization. Mm-hmm. Um, and both of those guys do have the ability. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan to see, to see expertise displayed. Yeah. Excellent. And then as far as, as far as films, any favorite fight films, whether it be blood sport or, you know, whether old school, new school, any ones in particular, that just kind of stand out to you. Born a champion. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> well, born a champion. Well, the inspirations <laughs> to born a champion. You need to check it out. Um, you know, I, I mean, I mean, uh, I, I, I like all kind of fight films. Um, mm. Most of my conflict films are war films, like right. the original Battle of Midway. Um, but man, come on. I mean, I, I, I loved Ab- Ab- Above the Law, the Seagal film when it came Seagal. out. I've seen them all, man. Yeah. All of them. From <laughs> Bruce Lee. To, come on, man. I've, I've seen them all. I've been a martial artist since I was nine. Wow. You know, and there's awesome. some of them that are utterly ridiculous. <laughs> Terrible. I still love them, man. Yeah. I still love them. I <laughs> still too. watch them multiple times. Despite <laughs> the ridiculousness, I'm watching that shit. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Sean, man, thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody, be sure to check out Born a Champion. Came out today, today. So be sure to check it out. Select theaters. It will be out on Blu ray as well as DVD January 26th, but you can find it on demand and in select theaters today. Again, big thank you to Sean Patrick Flannery. Thank you so much for joining us. Best you know, luck and success to this current film and, of course, future projects. And anytime that uh, you ever want to jump on the show, man, we'd love to have you. The, the passion screams from the microphone and from the screen. So, And uh, you're just a big ball of energy. Es- love especially it. after that Amazon Prime show comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, oh, man. Baby. I'd love to give you all a sneak peek of my... Uh, oh, well, we'll look, definitely man. have to set something up, man. We appreciate sure. you, bud. Um, yes! Yeah! Victory! And anger management? Fuck anger management.